Our speaker today is uh, Andrew Bunting, who is curator of the Scott Arboretum, uh, which is located at Swarthmore College, uh, just outside of Philadelphia. Uh, Andrew has worked at Chanticleer. He worked at the Morton Arboretum, Chicago Botanic Garden, uh, Fairchild Botanic Gardens, and also gardens in England and New Zealand. He's a graduate of Joliet uh, Junior College and also Southern, uh, Southern Illinois University. He's written numerous magazine articles that I've been aware of on woody plants, and he's currently working on a book <coughs> uh, of Timber Press on magnolias, so you need to be sure to look for that when it comes out in a year or so. And now, after more than 20 years at the Scott Arboretum, he's leaving in May to go back to Chicago to take a job there. He has traveled extensively outside the United States uh, with notable plant hunters, many of whom you'll see today, I think, um, <coughs> looking at plants, photographing plants, and evaluating them. And he's here today to talk about plant hunting in northern Vietnam. So please welcome Andrew Bunny. Ralston Arboretum, uh, Chris and Tim for uh, hosting me and having me back. I was here in, in March for a great, great event. Uh, also, I want to thank Bob, Bobby Ward and Bobby Wilder, and it was great to see uh, Rich Dufresne again. I haven't seen him, him in years. And it's great to be at, at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. I thank the J.C. Ralston Arboretum and J.C. Ralston really uh, epitomize uh, why people plant, plant collect, and uh, I got to know JC in the probably in the late '80s. He uh, every year would bring up a, a students from from uh, North Carolina State University, and he would do kind of a Delaware Valley tour and go to all the botanic gardens and arboretum in the area. And he would always come to the Scott Arboretum, and we would have lunch. And then subsequently, I made several trips down here. I stayed at JC's <coughs> house several times, and he was. Uh, as I'm sure all of you know, he was uh, you know incredibly generous with his plants, his time, and this was you know, this was before the internet. So you know he would uh, you know if you ha I would either write him or call him, and it, it might take you know weeks for him to get back because I think he probably had a docket of you know 500 people that he had to call or write letters to or send plants to, and he would always get back to us. And then every year he would send um, just a little box. It was probably about you know, a foot by a foot, and in it were about 30 either little rooted cuttings or little uh, seedlings. And uh, one of them, I remember, was uh, 1993, and we got, in that box, we got a Poliothersis sinensis, which I think he had collected somewhere in, in Asia. We got Euscaphus um, japonica, which is now a beautiful tree. We got a little seedling of uh, Magnolia denudata, that he collected the seed, the seed at Beijing Botanic Garden. And I mean, this, this thing was probably two inches tall. And now today it's probably 40 feet tall. It, it turned out to be fastidious, and several members from the Magnolia Society, including uh, Pat McCracken, said o over years, you know, this is much more fastidious than other Magnolia denudata, so we subsequently have named it Swarthmore Sentinel. And there's others in, in that little box, you know. So some of our most prized plants in our collections were all, you know, many were those little distributions made from, from JC. So for me, it's a real honor to, um, to be here at the JC Rolston Arboretum. I've been here many, many times over the years. It's still one of my most favorite botanic gardens in the, in the world to visit. So we can have the lights. Um, I'll get started. Is there any way to keep a little light up here or not? No? I can get you one going. All right, that'd be great. Though. Otherwise, I can't find, see my notes. But anyways, uh, uh, this was uh, a collecting trip that I took in, um, let's see, this would have been uh, <coughs> 2013 to northern Vietnam. And at the Scott Arboretum, where I, I currently work, uh, plant collecting is really not part of our, uh, our mission. But it's always something that I wanted to do as a, as a horticulturist. So in 2010, I got invited to go on a trip to uh, 
uh, Western China, uh, Sichuan, with Bill McNamara, who's the director of the Quarry Hill Botanic Garden. And that trip was partially paid for by uh, uh, a Chanticleer scholarship, which um, is a scholarship for professionals to do something that they don't normally do as part of their uh, career or, th or their job where they work. So that was my first plant collecting trip, and it really uh, excited me about plant collecting in the wild. You know, I, I obviously knew of people like, like J.C. Ralston and Dan Hinckley, uh, Peter Wharton, who was a great plant collector at University of British Columbia, and then a lot of the, the famed ones like Robert Fortune and E.H. Wilson and Kingdon Ward and pe people like that. I've read their stories and you know I've always fantasized about going uh, somewhere foreign to uh, collect seed. And then in 2012, I got invited by Dan Hinckley, Scott McMahon, and Ozzie Johnson to go to um, uh, Taiwan. And then, uh, then we went to Vietnam. And then last fall, we went to Hubei. Thanks, Chris. So this uh, <coughs> northern Vietnam, where we went, is the north, northern, the very northernmost part of Vietnam. And this is Hanoi. And we went, uh, we took a night train, an old Russian night train, up through the mountains to a, a village called uh, Sao Pa. But Hanoi is uh, nowadays very vibrant. Uh, a lot of people live there, a lot of markets. Uh, there is some international business there as well. Um, lots of little vegetable and fruit garden, or fruit markets, and a, a lot of hustle and bustle in the city. There's probably tens of times more scooters and bicycles than there are cars, and they all seem to be going uh, in opposite directions, right at each other, but seemingly find a way not to uh, have too many collisions. These are, uh, this is Diospyros khaki, the Asian persimmon. It's really fascinating just to see what uh, uh, different people are growing and selling in, in the markets. You know, some of them are recognizable fruits and vegetables, and other things are things that uh, I've just never seen before. So uh, once we were in, in Sapa, this is uh, Dan, Dan Hinckley on the left. You probably know him or know of him. And then on the right is a, a youngish man. He's in mid-30s. His name is Book, U-O-C. Uh, and this was Dan's, I think, 11th trip to northern Vietnam. He uh, still contends that uh, northern Vietnam probably, from a collecting point of view, is one of the richest places that remains kind of untouched in the world. And when he first went in the mid-90s, he went there on his own. And just by chance, he ran into Ook. And Ook kind of knew the area and was able to help him get access into the mountainous area north of Sapa, which you don't have to go far. If you go 10 miles beyond the mountains in northern Sapa, you end up in, in China. Uh, so just to give you a sense of geographically you know, how, how far north it is. And also, those mountains get as high as 10,000 feet. So, Anytime you do plant collecting, especially if you live in temperate parts of the world, like Scott and Ozzy live in uh, Atlanta, I live in Philadelphia, Dan lives in Seattle, and while those climates are a little bit warmer, we're still looking for things, especially in areas that you might in your mind's eye think of as being more subtropical, like Vietnam. If you want to get hardiness out of this plant, you need to go up in elevation. So. You know, a lot of Vietnam is uh, pretty much lowland, subtropical, if not tropical, especially the farther you go south. But up, up north in uh, Five Finger Mountains, and then the real famous mountain range there is the Fancy Pan Mountains. Uh, that gets up to about 10,000 feet. So, you know, just in theory, the higher you go in elevation, the more hardiness that's going to be genetically kind of embedded in these plants. That doesn't always work that way, but in general, in general it does. So Uk was our guide for this trip. Uk has now become such a famous kind of plantsman that any group that goes collecting in northern Vietnam, all of them have Uk. Uh, there was just a trip this fall, Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh, 
University of British Columbia and Vancouver and Longwood Gardens went and they had both as, as their guide. And at first he knew nothing about um, plants and now he knows them well enough that he can actually help identify things. There's a brother that climbs a tree like a monkey and he can go up and get the seed. And now he has a, a brother-in-law who's a uh, has a travel agency, so it can also arrange all the buses. <laughs> and so, you know, it really became become a, uh, a businessman. This interest that's uh, book in the background. We went to his house the first night for dinner, and his front yard was uh, this conifer, which is a mentotaxis, which is a really rare uh, conifer. And I'll show you some images of it a little bit later. So. I think he's even become a little bit of a, a collector uh, himself. Uh, one of the reasons we also wanted to go to this area is uh, in more recent history, uh, uh, Peter Wharton, who was a, a famous plant collector who died uh, fairly early from cancer, had collected several times in northern, in this part of northern Vietnam. So that was somewhat chronicled. And then uh, a Kingdon Ward had, had been to this area, Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh, <coughs> and a few others. But even though there have been subsequent trips, and Dan has now been another time, so he's now been 12 times, it still is an area that uh, there's many, many mountains, and it seems like almost, and, and even kind of these bigger hills or knolls, and almost every single one you go up has you know, floristically, there may be some components that are the same, but there's many things that may just be specific to each of those mountains. So if there's, say, a thousand of these peaks, you know, everyone in theory, you know, should, should be explored. But it's also an area, like Sapa is this kind of, uh, almost has a Swiss feel to it. It's this mountain town that really didn't have a whole lot going on, but now has become very attractive for, uh, especially European hikers and mountain climbers. So when Dan first went, there was like one hotel. Now there's like 40. And so to build these hotels, they're uh, cutting uh, timber and lumber from, from the woods, you know, pulling it down the mountains and building these hotels. So while there isn't like clear cutting going on, there is much a higher level of deforestation going on now than there ever was before. So there's Sapa. You can see in the back, those are the fancy pan mountains. And they're spelled, if you look in the literature, sometimes it's spelled F-A-N-S-I-P-A-N. Sometimes it's spelled P-H-A-N-X-I-P-A-N. It's spelled a whole, whole bunch of different ways. And uh, there's not a lot of Americans there. Another thing that's probably going to ruin this part of the country is uh, up until just a couple of years ago, the only way to get there was by this kind of Russian, old Russian night train. Uh, although Mark Zuckerberg went and he took a private helicopter, but uh, <laughs> most people would take the train. And, but now there's a highway that's been built from Hanoi to uh, Sapa, so I think that's going to open it up. And if it really becomes a true, truly kind of touristy type place, that's going to even uh, more so degrade uh, the, the, the forest. And one, you know, there's several reasons why we plant collect. Uh, one of them is obviously to find new plants. It could be good ornamental plants for, for our gardens. But uh, probably even more important is uh, to collect things that are in danger of being destroyed in the wild so that they can be at least represented in an ex situ collection, which means a collection like a botanic garden or an arboretum. J.C. Ralston Arboretum being a perfect example of a fantastic ex situ collection of wild collected material. And then uh, some of these ex situ collections can actually work to uh, repopulate areas where maybe the plant is either on the edge of extinction or is extinct. And a really good example is um, the first trip I went on in 2010 to Sichuan with Bill McNamara. One of his pet plants is uh, Acer pentaphyllum, which is considered the rarest maple in the world. It's only found a along a couple river valleys in Sichuan. He's been multiple times collected mul from multiple plants just to create as much kind of genetic diversity as possible. And where those plants are found, they may not even be there now, you know, four, four years on, because in that area they're creating all these hydroelectric 
um, power stations from, and then damming up these rivers. So once they're dammed up, all those plants will just be underwater and be gone. But he has now uh, an orchard of these Acer pentaphyllums. He probably has 200 plants in it, so he's getting cross-pollination, <coughs> getting good seed germination if they ever wanted to kind of repopulate um, it in China. At least there's a source for that. Lots of, you know, we always go to the markets to see what's being grown. Uh, these are shoots of Ipomoea morning glory that are cut like uh, almost for salad. Uh, there's a lot of bizarre things. Uh, that, this is not that bizarre, but uh, I, I didn't include the picture of the, the dog for sale. Uh, anyways, there's uh, fit, you know, lots of fish. What you see here are little pans with live fish and then little bubblers in the pans to keep the, the fish alive. So that's about as fresh fish as you can find. So, uh, you know, what we do is uh, <coughs> we work on a bit of a itinerary before we go, although, you know, with any of these itineraries, there has to be some level of uh, flexibility because things do change. And so this was just outside of Sopan. This was an Alpinia that we found. We did find some fruit on it. I think Dan has some plants growing of it now. It's like a, a hedicium or one of the flowering gingers. Uh, real fragrant flowers. Uh, this is Ozzy Johnson who lives in Atlanta, Georgia. And he's particularly interested in herbaceous plants. He does a lot with begonias and jesneriads. So he's kind of our ground guy. Like you know, we have our tree our eyes up in the trees and shrubs and he has his eyes on the ground floor. He does a lot about ferns as well. And then this is Scott McMahon who uh, also lives in Atlanta. He has a little uh, wholesale nursery north of Atlanta in Claremont, Georgia called McMahon's Nursery, but he also has a garden center in downtown Atlanta called uh, Garden Hood. And he used to be the curator at the Atlanta Botanic Garden. I would say he's probably more interested in woody things, but uh, definitely has a passion for herbaceous plants. This is Dan Hinckley. Probably, if you could quantify plant collecting over the last hundred years, he's probably done more plant collecting than anybody probably since E.H. Wilson. I think he's been on six, over 60 uh, plant collecting trips, been to China 11 times, Vietnam 12 times, every, almost every country in Southeastern Asia. Uh, after this trip, we were there three weeks, and went to two more weeks to Myanmar, uh, Sikkim, Nepal, been to Bhutan, Korea, many trips to Japan, South Africa, South of Chile, Costa Rica, Turkey, and I'm sure there's, there's others as well, and, and the United States as well. So he is, uh, he's hardcore. <laughs> so here's close to the Alpinia. You know, our, our plant collecting protocol is a little bit different than some other plant collectors. Like some of the real scientific institutions like the Arnold Arboretum, Morton Arboretum, Morris Arboretum, what they'll do is everything they collect, they also take at least one herbarium specimen, maybe up to a triplicate. Like the trip I went on with University of British Columbia, we took it at every plant we collected, we took a herbarium specimen. So one specimen went back to Sichuan University, which was our host. Another went to um, uh, the, uh, maybe maybe Berkeley, somewhere in California. I think the third went to Missouri Botanic Garden. And that, that's great, but it does kind of slow up the process. Our, our process is a bit more streamlined in that we uh, photographically take, you know, we take pictures and then we take extensive notes and we have kind of an accession ledger for each plant and then we collect, collect the seed. So like our first plant, we you just use our la last name, uh, initials of our last name, so and do it in alphabetical order. So this trip would be uh, Bunting, uh, Hinckley, Johnson, McMahon, and so B H J M. And then the first one would be dash 001 and, and so on. Which is a little tricky to keep track of all of that because every bag has to have that written on it or it's easy to quickly 
lose uh, track of all your seed. So here we're starting to kind of climb in uh, elevation. Uh, this is uh, Luculia, which is the ruby ACA. It's actually subtropical. Dan has tried it in Seattle. It's fragrant, but it's not really a plant for um, kind of our, our climates. Uh, but it could be a good conservatory or house plant. One of the plants we did want to collect, and before we started, we kind of had a list of our target species and target genera. One of our target uh, genus, or target genera, I guess, was uh, magnolia. And uh, this is a really rich area for magnolias. We had at least 10 on our target list. And there's a, a man up in um, uh, Pickens, South Carolina, named Dick Figler, who's uh, uh, one of the world's renowned experts on magnolias. So we, Ozzy and I went up there, and he had created a key for us how to identify the different Vietnamese magnolias just by their leaves and by the stipular scar on the petiole, uh, which all made sense when we were getting our tutorial and <laughs> made zero sense when we were actually trying to identify them in the field. But with you know cell phones and in Sapa they have Wi-Fi, we would take pictures at night, send them to Dick, and you know within a 24-hour period he would identify them. So yeah. I think we I had 12 that we were, you know, most of them we couldn't figure out, and he figured them all out. So that was a great resource. So this is Magnolia foveolata. And this was, uh, we collected this at uh, uh, 5,300 feet. So a little low, you know, we really wanted to get up like 8,000 feet, 7,500 feet, and do most of our collecting. And this is uh, right, right outside the door here, there's a uh, Magnolia foveolata hybrid. So it's a plant that's already in the country. People are using it for hybridizing purposes because it's, it's one, it's evergreen. So the more evergreen magnolias we can have, all, uh, the better. You know, right now we have you know, Magnolia grandiflora, Magnolia virginiana, and a, a handful of Asiatic species, but they're only just kind of coming in to commerce. And the interesting thing about this plant is the underside of the leaves has an indumentum like Magnolia grandiflora, but grandiflora is brown and this indumentum is golden. So if you could get that golden indumentum hybridized, say, into something like Magnolia grandiflora, you'd be onto something. Kind of interesting fruits. And there's the beautiful in indumentum. And there's, uh, right now with Magnolias, uh, I think it's going through an unprecedented uh, renaissance in that there's a lot more cultivars available, period. And there's just incredible hybridizing going on. There's a magnolia we collected on this trip called uh, Insignus. And typical, typical Insignus has pink flowers, but there are some that are almost pure red. So you know, back in the 70s, 80s, the holy grail for the magnolia world was the yellow magnolia. And then Magnolia Elizabeth came on the scene. And now there's probably 50 different yellow magnolias. Uh, what you'll see probably in the next five to ten years is a true red magnolia. There's some that are called red now, but they're more of a reddish purple. Uh, so that that's something to to be aware of, and I'm sure it, it will happen. Not only a red magnolia, but like uh, a red version of magnolia grandiflora. So if you can imagine your southern magnolia, those big white fragrant flowers being red, that would be pretty impressive. And there's a book. Up there harvesting seed for us. The tree itself doesn't have great form, but again, if you grew out a bunch of seedlings and selected from a, them, you might get something that's uh, a little less gangly. We saw a lot of this at, at lower elevations. Uh, this is uh, Osbeckia, which is uh, related to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to uh, Tibicina, to Melastomataceae. Again, it's uh, you know a little. Uh, it would be on the tender side. It'd have to be grown as a, an outdoor uh, tropical plant. Uh, the other plants that we were looking for, as far as magnolias goes, is uh, Magnolia sapiensis, which was uh, actually discovered by Dan in this area, named for Sapa. Magnolia martinii, Cathcardii, Balionii, Insignis, Championii as well as uh, many others. 
So this was uh, you know, kind of our typical group. And this is, uh, so Uk assembled uh, you know, several porters to help us carry our gear so that we could go up in these areas and camp for a couple days or a few days. Uh, you can do you know, what's considered roadside collecting where you just drive and if there's an area, get out and kind of wander around and see, see what you want. But usually those areas are uh, compromised. There's erosions happen. Maybe there's uh, areas have been cut for um, agricultural purposes, grazing, tim timber <coughs> extraction. So you really want to get up into the jungle so that you can really find areas that are, are relatively pure. Uh, this area that we went to on our first uh, trek was called uh, Ban Kwong. And so you, here's a book. And then these porters, these guys are little guys. They're probably like five foot three, 110 pounds. But they're incredibly strong. And they hike in these little like plastic sandals. <laughs> and we were on some incredibly treacherous, street, steep terrain. You know, we were where we could barely stand up straight. These little guys have, you know, a hundred pound pack on and they're just kind of scrambling up the, the mountain face. So this is kind of typical terrain. You know, these are terraced for mainly rice. Uh, again, there's the Osbekia. So we won't really want to get up here and get out of these kind of agricultural lands, but you have to hike through them uh, to, to get up to the higher elevations. So again, still kind of subtropical flora. This is uh, a cutting hamia, the China <laughs> fir, which they use as a, a cultivated timber tree. This you're probably familiar with. This uh, is Liriodendron chinense. I know there's one out here on the grounds called J.C. Ralston. And this is the Chinese version of, of our native tulip poplar, or southern poplar tulip tree. Uh, it's Liriodendron chinense, so for all intents and purposes, it looks like our native tulip tree, but it has a bigger, broader leaf. And then the canopy, when you grow one out, it actually has a rounder canopy versus our native one, which is very upright. This one, the leaves are even more exaggerated because it's been coppice back, like cut for you know a little bit of firewood or something like that. And while it has the epithet chinense, and it's found through southern China, it shows up in uh, uh, Vietnam. It's probably also in northern Laos, maybe in Myanmar as well. So it has a fairly broad uh, geographic range. And we would have collected this if, if it had seed on it, but because it was cut back, there was no seed. But it's a great plant. We have one at the Scott Arboretum that's probably 30 feet tall. And it's just a beautifully broadly rounded tree. So Ozzy, as I mentioned before, is kind of the man on the ground. And here he's found a, a Jesneriad, a hardy Jesneriad at, at about 6,200 feet. Uh, a lot of these things, we don't even know what they are. You know, if we can get it down to the genus, you know, we feel like we've accomplished something. <laughs> Sometimes it's just the family, or maybe not even the family. So you put Jesneri ACA like or something on the, <laughs> on the, you know, in your notes. And, and that's kind of the, the beginning. So, you know, we collect these things. They're at least from a visual point of view, they look attractive. Um, or we know that it could be important from a conservation point of view. So we collect it. Uh, we have to clean all the seed, and I'll get into that a little bit later. It all has to be, make it back to the United States, not be uh, destroyed by the USDA or Know, for whatever reason, uh, it gets imported to the United States, so we have to grow everything uh, from seed, hope that it germinates, hope that it grows. And some of these things might, you know, we may be collecting seed from a fairly mature plant, and it may not flower for 10 to 15 years, and it, we can't really truly identify it until it does flower, and we can key it out. So, you know, that's kind of the end of the process, is uh, getting a, a real name on it. So for many years, it may just be in our database. I'm sure that you have many of these examples at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum, where it just says Magnolia SP period, or Cornus SP period, which means unknown species. Or it may say something like 
cornus a f f period kappa ten kappa which means it has an affinity towards kappa theta, but it may not necessarily necessarily be kappa theta. So here's Ozzy collecting this uh, to his Nariad. Why does he have a face <coughs> mask on? What is he, what? Why does he have a face mask on? Because he's weird. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think he has a face mask on. I think what you're seeing is uh, here's his face, and in his pocket, he has a plastic bag. Oh. So it looks like he uh, <laughs> has a face mask. <laughs> So he, you know, what he'll do is he'll take a picture, he'll lay it out, take measurements. We'll try to capture as much information as we possibly can, because uh, this is our one, you know, until we actually grow it, this is our one-time chance to, do to document uh, this plant. This is uh, one of those kind of aft plants. This is Cornus aft capitata which is an evergreen version of the Cusa dogwood, Cornus Cusa. And even in Swarthmore, uh, Cornus Capitata, or we grow one called uh, Angustata, Cusa Angustata is evergreen. Uh, there's also one that looks similar to this, which is not this one called uh, Cornus Hong Kongensis, which uh, Tom Rainey, who's part of North Carolina State University system, but is out in Fletcher, North Carolina, out in the west near Asheville. He's using Cornus capitata as a, a hybridizing parent to create these dwarf evergreen, essentially shrub-like versions of Cornus cusa, which are pretty interesting. And that's another reason we collect too. People like Tom Rainey and other hybridizers want our germplasm. So Tom Rainey, when he works on a genus, you know, he's been working on, for example, Mahonias. He's also working on Magnolias as well is when he starts out to work on hybridizing Mahonias, he wants to get every single Mahonia known to mankind. And a lot of these really esoteric ones that have only been collected once only exist in the botanic garden. And uh, if any, you know, I've heard people say, you know, why, why do people have botanic gardens? You know, they're just pretty places for people to go and walk around. And yes, they're that, but they're also, you know, so much more significant from a conservation, a germplasm point of view that I think most people really uh, realize. So when Tom starts to amass his program for Mahonia, he goes to Botanic Gardens and tries to get you know, a cutting, you know, maybe some seed or whatever, and gets all these plants together, grows them all on, so that when he wants to uh, execute the goals of his breeding program, he has you know, maho red Mahonias from wherever, or silver underside Mahonias from Mexico, and then he can start doing his, his work. This is a uh, Hyprangia heteromala, which is kind of a big stature, almost tree-like uh, Hydrangea. Looks almost kind of like a Hydrangea paniculata, which you know is that cone-shaped flower, and Hydrangea blooms in, in the summertime. Not a great picture, but you can see the old uh, inflorescence. And we go, when we go collecting, we're typically going in the fall, because we want to see, well, we want, want, we want to see seed. It would be great to go like in the spring and scout things out, and then go back in the fall and, and harvest seed. And uh, we're actually, this spring, uh, Scott is going <laughs> to uh, Arunachal Pradesh, which is you know, way up in northern India. And that, the basis of that trip is to do a scouting trip. We want to go there, but we're not quite sure if it's going to be hardy enough. So he's going to go and kind of do kind of a reconnaissance mission. And there has been some collecting. There's a guy named Aaron Floden, who's at University of Tennessee, that's done collecting Pliganatums and Smilocinas, Uvularias, Dysporums, Dysporopsis. Um, but we want to check out what the woody flora is there. Before we send four people, you know, send one is still expensive enough. And all these trips are, um, it's great if you can find institutional funding, but there aren't a whole lot of institutions doing regular collecting. We had a, an event here in, in uh, actually in early March, uh, Bobby Wilder was at and others, 
where we did a fundraise, a joint fundraising mission or evening, we're in an auction and people came and half the money is going towards our consortium, the other half towards Mark Weddington's consortium. So, and that's kind of how these collecting trips happen is we, um, you know, we solicit people to fund uh, our trips. Some of them are individuals, some of them are, you know, botanic gardens and arboretum, but every trip is kind of cobbled together with various uh, funding sources. So here's the guys, not only do they carry all our stuff up, but they prepare our camping site and they cook us dinner and cook us breakfast, and they essentially do. Other than collecting, they're doing most of the work. This is really interesting fern. We uh, tried to collect, it's uh, Dipterus sinensis. Uh, when we were in uh, Taiwan, we uh, saw a similar species called uh, Dipterus corrugata. And uh, I know Tony Amen has tried to get this in the United States without success. Um, even if you get spore, the spore don't germinate. So this, uh, as far as ferns go, is kind of one of the holy grails of the fern world. It stands, it almost looks kind of like a may apple where it has a central stem and then a big kind of peltate leaf. But the leaf to the touch is very kind of you know, rough, almost feels like uh, cardboard. If we see a rhododendron, we collect it. Uh, we, while they may not be of use to us, there are people who have rhododendron collections like Steve Hootman at the Rhododendron Species Foundation or Harold Jenkins at, I mean, Harold Sweetman at the Jenkins Arboretum. So there are, we know, you know, as we collect, there's other people who would benefit from our, our collections. So here we are getting up uh, in elevation. Uh, you know, we're at this point about, uh, probably about 7,000 feet up, which is getting kind of into the zone that we want to be in. You know, finding a campsite's not easy. There aren't like nice, uh, you know, pre-established campsites. So what they did is they, this is a bamboo grove. They just cut down bamboo and then the stuff they cut, they used as kind of bedding. So, you know, these bamboo spears weren't shooting up for our tent. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think it is, uh, when you think about plant collecting or, you know, I mean, we're actually seed collecting, not so much plant collecting, is there is kind of this romantic idea about it. Uh, and, and it is fun, but there's a lot of things that aren't fun. Like this area, was, there was a lot of leeches. So, um, you know, you have to constantly check, you know, your, your socks and your legs for, for leeches. Uh, the paths are narrow, the, you know, hiking and the terrain is rugged and steep. Uh, rain rains a lot. Uh, and you, you know, part of the, the excitement is you never know what you'll find, uh, but part of the downside is you also mm -hmm. never know what you'll find. <laughs> we have rice, uh, they brought in some chicken, we had some uh, fish here. Uh, the following morning we had uh, banana crepes, which were really good. Dan had a little canteen with some scotch in it. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, here's, uh, this is probably Lilium arborcolon, uh, collecting seed. Occasionally we'll take a, a little division of a plant, but bringing plants back in the United States is really difficult. Uh, there's much more USDA scrutiny than bringing seed back in, although there is you know, fairly high level of scrutiny as well. And the way we bring in seed is under a permit called a small seed lots permit, which allows you to bring in, in one box or packet, 50 packets of seed, and in each packet, 50 seeds. And each you know, box or bigger packet has to have an exact list of what you have, and the seed have to be perfectly clean. They can't have any bit of pulp or anything on them. Or what they'll do is if they open one pack and they find a little worm or a little bit of pulp, will incinerate the whole box. So you really have to be uh, thorough in your seed cleaning. So this is incredible. This is going up to the top of, we're going to uh, the top of Five Fingers Ridge. And I'll show you a picture of it at the very end. And this was, uh, it was pouring rain. 
the mound had kind of sloughed off to the side, and uh, to the side it was a straight drop down of 1,500 feet Jeez. to uh, you know rocky chasm below. And it's hard to see on the other side, but it had done the same thing on the other side. So we're basically going up this razorback, and I didn't know it until right then that Dan is really scared of heights. Uh, and this looks like a little kid, but it's actually one of our guides. And you know, they just scurried up there. We're just like, you know, at that point we're sopping wet. There's uh, five fingers. I'll show you a better picture at that, that end. But uh, on this trip, we uh, so we came that other side. We were coming up right through here, and this was. By the time we got to there, it was just a steep climb up almost like a cliff. And we came down this side, and it was all uh, bamboo. And we came down into this valley, and we had um, lunch in a little shack where they harvest uh, uh, ca cardamom. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was pouring rain. And we had a, lo a local guide, not this guy, but a local guide who was you know, kind of leading us on this trail. <coughs> and we continued on the trail after we had lunch in this cardamom shack. And it became quickly apparent that he didn't know where he was going. <laughs> and you can see him communicating with the local guides. And, uh, <coughs> you, know, they, you know, they all seem to have kind of a blank look on their face. And we ended up going off the trail, kind of bushwhacking through this cardamom, kind of traversing, you know, we had to kind of forged through a river, up another slope, down over another slope, because he thought it was going to take us to this path, which it did, didn't. So we were kind of doing this switchback thing, and we were supposed to come out that night. We didn't have any more food, so we had to spend an extra night there. The next, next morning, they were pretty confident that they could get us out. I mean, eventually they did, but it was, uh, uh, Dan said it was the most rigorous uh, hiking and kind of bushwhacking he's, he's a, a, ever had to do. And plus the, the fact there was no food. So luckily our <coughs> one guy was able to find some uh, native bananas and some other, other, other things. So after we got lost, so we came through kind of right in here somewhere, came down, got lost in here for a better part of the day. They came out here and then one of our guys was like, oh, you know, I remember the spot. We herded water buffaloes here three years ago. And the highway is just over there. Well, just over there was another five-hour hike. And eventually, we find, we had cell phones, but there's no there's no cell phone reception in, in the top of Five Fingers. I can guarantee you. GPS? Not even GPS. Nothing. Yeah, it was uh, like the dead zone. So these are these are um, those are five fingers. So seed collecting we're kind of doing all along the way, and uh, we would do Sapa as kind of our hub. So we might do like a three day trek, come back to Sapa, sort our seed, and so if it's like a, a seed that has flesh on it, we put it in a plastic bag and just start manipulating it, trying to get the seed coat off it. If it was, say, in a capsule or something that needed to open up and kind of dehiss, then it would either go in a bag or once we had switched it up and kind of gotten some of the pulp off, it would go into a, a coffee filter. And all these supplies, you know, probably, you know, half of our suitcase or bag that we bring over, half is clothes and half is, is supplies. So lunch bags, coffee filters, this is that kind of uh, paper towel that uh, mechanics use, that kind of thick, uh, absorbing blue paper towel, which comes in handy. Now, a lot of our work is just kind of sit ar sitting around, talking, drinking tea, figuring out where we're going to go. So this is an area called uh, uh, Ban Quan. Uh, these are all uh, rice fields. And again, we want to get up into those mountains on, on the edge. So we went from ba Banguan to uh, Haijiang. This was uh, October 8th. So the 
here they're cutting, cutting uh, the rice, bring it out to the roadside, and then they'll take it to a, a, a thrasher to extract the, you know, the actual rice grain from the, uh, the leafy part. So we want to go up, as I mentioned before, these little kind of knolls or mini mountains. Each one kind of holds some genetic material that may be unique from one to another. And so we went through kind of this farmer's field and, you know, get its low elevation south, none of which really uh, interests us too much. And you can see, you know, agricultural, agricultural, and then about here it turns more into like truly forested. <coughs> and you can tell your low elevations because there's cannas growing and uh, cariota, which is one of the palms. So that's kind of a good indicator that it's probably not high enough to have uh, much um, hardiness. This is a, a, a maple leaf that Hook <coughs> found. Who knows what it is? Dan had never seen it before. It wasn't in seed. It had been, again, kind of coppice back, so, but you know, pretty interesting. And while we collected some maples, it is a, a treasure trove of, of maples as well. Uh, lots of erosemas. Again, we would collect those. And with erosemas, even if you get them when they're green, like that, the seed on the inside it is ripe. But with erosemas, you have to be careful, you know, harvesting the seed because uh, they have a chemical in them that can uh, numb your fingers. You know, the uh, houseplant dum cane does the same thing. Uh, we collected this. This is Magnolia capcardii. <coughs> One way to tell that is it has a real pronounced midrib on the underside of the leaf. But what we wanted to go up to the top of one of those knolls for, we had heard that on one of those was this plant, uh, was this conifer. Here it is in its juvenile form, and that's its mature foliage. And actually, most of the plant had to cut back for uh, fencing or firewood or something. And this is a Xanthocypris vietnamensis, which is considered the world's rarest uh, conifer. It was discovered in 2002 in uh, Bad Dot San Nature Reserve, uh, but it's also, there's confirmed sightings in Guangxi, China. Uh, it's related to uh, Camisipris. Like Camisipris nucatensis has now been reclassified as Xanthocypris nucatensis, so it's most closely related uh, related to the Alaskan cypress or cedar. And Dan had actually collected this before. He found one in a farmer's field. That he, obviously, the farmer dug it up and grown it next to his house for some reason, and he had taken some cuttings. So, you know, that was our goal is to take some cuttings of this plant, get it back, and get, and get it propagated. And Dan probably now has 200 of these plants growing. Who knows how many are in the wild? There could be, you know, we found that one. There's a confirmed sighting in China. There may be, I mean, there could be hundreds in the wild, or there could be two. You know, it's, it's hard to know. And given that, you know, it's not a big tree to begin with, it's probably attractive for a farmer to go up and cut it. Also, it's a you know, cedar family, so the farmer's going to know that that wood is less likely to rot. And that's probably why it's being cut. This is a plant that uh, Ron Dieterman at uh, the Atlanta Botanic Garden, who's a uh, uh, world's authority on subtropical conifers, has propagated a lot of it. So, you know, this is a conservation success story. And in this area, this immediate area where we were collecting uh, uh, the Xanthocypris, some of the other uh, coniferous species that were there were Pseudocygus sinensis, Calocedrus rupestris, Amentotaxis yemenensis, Taxus chinensis, Suga chinensis, Focinia hajinzii, and Pinus quangtongensis. So, you know, quite a diversity of conifers uh, to begin with. Um, Ozzy also found uh, an interesting Mahonia there. There we are, and looking a little cheery. <laughs> The Xanthocypris is actually this little tree here. 
This is a Mahonia that Ozzy collected. Uh, Maho or Ozzy is a big Mahonia collector. He, uh, he's the creator of Mahonia Soft Caress, which is a popular Mahonia, especially in the southeast and the south. Uh, this is one that's probably Mahonia F, F or affinity to Decloiana. I think this one we took some cuttings of. So from there we kind of came over a couple more of these knolls and came down through uh, this little village of native people called the uh, Daos, D-A-O. And we came in the village and Uk uh, said that it's probably unlikely that these villagers had ever in real life seen a, a white person. And when we ran into some of them, it, it became obvious. I mean, these villages are so remote. You know, by foot, they're probably 15 miles from the nearest road. And they're so embedded in these kind of, you know, it's not just like walking 15 miles. You have to go over, you know, and over and over these hills. And then even if they made it to their local village of significance, there's probably not a whole lot of uh, Westerners that they would come in contact with. And there's really no reason for them to live, could leave because they're completely 100% subsistence farmers. There's no electricity, running water. These villages, here's some amaranth, uh, bananas. So we were invited in, and these are three generations, father, son, and grandson. And they gave us, they called it rice wine. Well, it was hardly rice wine. I think it was uh, the moonshine version of uh, <laughs> this Dow village. It was incredible as far as its intensity. You can t it's hard to see, but this guy had obviously been drinking it for a better part of the day. <laughs> so you have to hike up this uh, steep terrain. These are uh, very steep terraces. This is all rice. All these flags are their equivalent of a scarecrow. And this is kind of the terrain, these, you know, valleys and then these really interesting steep peaks. I mean, these peaks, I don't even think you could easily traverse them, you know, to get to the top of them, which would be really interesting because they're completely pure, you know, they're un, not, it would be almost impossible for somebody to even get up there and cut timber. So if you could get up there, it'd be, uh, neat to see what you might find. So from there we went to um, uh, Ban Quan. This is an area that uh, Dan and Ozzy and Scott had been back to, or had been to in 2010. And one of the plants we wanted to try to find was this. This is a, a Mentotaxus photoiensis, which with the Xanthus cypress is one of the rarest conifers also in the world. And this was up, we went up, one, Dan and I went up one of those, not as steep as one of those in the picture, but a pretty steep uh, mountain. So Dan and I went up one side, and Oak went up another side, and, and Scott and Ozzy decided to go up another side. So we were on this side, <coughs> valley here, Another one of these little mini mountains over there. What Ozzy and Scott found just in the one right next to us was completely different. Like they were collecting viburnums, sambucus, quercus, cornus, hydrangea. We didn't find any of that on our side. We found the mentotaxis and uh, some other interesting species. But it was a straight climb up. We really had to grab branches and things that to get to the top, and the mentotaxis was at the top. So essentially, it's like uh, an exaggerated U, taxis, with uh, taxis like leaves, or even, if you know, the genus Torea, kind of similar to that, but real distinct, distinct and ornamental stomatal bands on the undersides of the leaves. So we were kind of up, up, up in here. Here's uh, some of our collections. A lot of those were what uh, Scott and Ozzy had gotten from the other side. So that gives you a sense of kind of the, the elevation. So we had, you know, we had to park down here and hike all the way up there. And I, th I thought I was in shape. 
Uh, so you, you do a complete vertical climb, and I, I must say Dan is definitely in shape, and Scott is definitely in shape. And they, uh, what they do to kind of prepare for one of these trips is, I mean, they might work out regularly anyways, but say six months before the trip, they'll go like on the Stairmaster four times a week and really kind of you know, build up their cardiovascular capacity, which uh, in retrospect is handy. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see just endless little peaks like, like that. Some of these, these are probably two lowlands, but still kind of an in interesting terrain. This was a really interesting hotel we stayed in. The hotels, none of those are pre-booked. We just kind of you know, go into a village, if we're not camping out, and try to find a place to stay. And this hotel, it's hard to see, but the way you get to the front de desk is you drive there. So you drive through this corridor, pull up to the front desk, and get your room. We were there for Oak's birthday, so he, uh, it was up to him to pick what he wanted to have for our appetizer. Can you guess what these are? No. Yes? Uh, deep fried bee larva. But like anything deep fried, it, you know, it all tastes kind of the same. <laughs> Along the road, we saw this dry, and this is a the bark of the cinnamon tree. <clears throat> the, the, the native people are called uh, <coughs> uh, Black Mong, it's called H-M-O-N-G, and they have these outfits, they look like they're, they're black, but they're actually made from uh, an indigo, so they're really almost like a, a dark, almost blackish purple, but it, it kind of reads as, as being black. <coughs> Did you see any of that indigo being dyed? No. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know where they do it. They, you know, they farm all, the, all around, mainly, mainly South Pond. This is in the South Pond. So I, I don't, we didn't, you know, we didn't walk through any of those fields. So this is our typical hotel room. Like by the end of the trip, uh, I'm sure the maids uh, love us. You know, we take, you know, we might have like three rooms between us and we really need the space to kind of spread out everything that we have. And so it might be a, a paper bag or a plastic bag, but every bag has a label either in it or something written on the outside of it uh, that may have the name and it, may, it should definitely have the number. And then we're kind of moving things through these bags multiple times. And you know, if we're kind of manipulating the fleshy seed, then there's maybe two people in the bathroom, in the bathtub with all these sieves and strainers, getting it so that all the seed has all the pulp cleaned off. Once it's cleaned off, it goes into the coffee filter and dries there for a couple days. But we're also on the move a lot of times, so then we have to take everything with us. So when we were in Hubei last year, I had all the dried seed in my hotel room. I could barely get to my bed because I had like 200 you know, bags like this just all over the floor. And the hope is, so if the trip is three weeks, by the end of three weeks, you have to have all your seed processed. So, you know, probably halfway through the tri trip, you're doing the whole seed, pro starting seed processing. And you need to get it down to where, you know, you have 50 dry seed in a little envelope with the name on it. And then we uh, um, need to find some place where we can ship it back to the United States. It has all our permits in the box. And what we do is we do everything in triplicate. So you know, for a typical trip, we might collect 250 to 300 different seeds. And so if we have 300 seeds, we actually have 900 seed packets. Because we'll do one shipment will go to uh, Atlanta. Maybe one goes through Philadelphia. One goes through, say, San Francisco or Seattle. 
with the idea is if they do get seized, uh, that uh, it, it kind of hedges our bets so that all, all the seed uh, comes through ultimately. And as we're getting back to, you know, as we get back to the rooms, this is kind of stuff we would do for Dick Figler. We would photograph the leaf, uh, put the elevation on the underside of the leaves, take a picture particularly of like, uh, if we could find the stipular scar on the petiole, size, the size of the leaf. And uh, as I mentioned before, in every case, he was able to identify them. This is, uh, I think this is Cathcardii. That's Cathcardii. <coughs> That one I think is maybe Sapiensis. This one you can see is a low elevation. This one was uh, 3,100 feet by rope pubescent on the underside. So that one he didn't know, but he has a, a colleague at uh, Hanoi University. So he, what well, we sent him, that he sent to that guy, and that guy identified it as Magnolia balionii, which is a subtropical magnolia. So this is uh, probably the last two or three days of the trip is all seed sorting. Uh, Dan's mate, I mean he helps with seed sorting, but he's also keeping our database. So here's a laptop, Excel spreadsheet, you know, BHJM001, whatever we think it is, and then it's like probably 12 uh, cells of information, elevation goes in there, associated plants, aspect, oops, you know, what mount we were on, what day we were there, you know, what was the soil like, anything that we could capture that might be, might be of use. And then at the, at the very end of the trip, we, um, we went to uh, Ban Quan, and we wanted to, well, Ozzy and Scott and those guys had been there, I think, two years before, maybe two years before that. And uh, they were looking, or we were looking for this tree. This is uh, Aeschylus wangii, which, again, probably is one of the rarest horse chestnuts in the world. It's uh, endemic to Vietnam. Uh, Peter Wharton had stumbled upon it on a, a trip to this area. Uh, with one of his trips to the University of British Columbia. Apparently it's a tree that fruits every other year, but the fruits are, you know, horse chestnut typically has a fruit like this. On those, they're like a gigantic, one of the bigger softballs. So when they fall to the ground, they're easy to kind of, you just feel them underfoot. And so we went in here again, it's all cardamom as an understory. And we must have trounced around there for four hours and didn't find one. So we must have been, either something collected before us, which is probably unlikely, or it was just, it's off here. And um, so Dan went back, go you know, again. I think he went again this year af after Hubei. Yeah, he did. He went after Hubei just for about a week. And he found uh, Aeschylus wangii. And what's great about it is, you collect in the fall, you sow it immediately, and he already has plants you know, from the fall that are five feet tall, because they set up immediately a shoot and they just keep growing you know, for about five feet until they stop. So we're, he's gonna send me one, I'm gonna try it in Swarthmore. It'll, it maybe will be hardy there, uh, probably not. Uh, probably hardy here, do you know if you guys have one? No. Yeah, it dies to the ground as well. Okay, does it come back? Uh, I've killed one and I have one inside the Okay. So, you know, maybe, I know Scott has one in Atlanta. His, and where he, he's in, in Claremont, which is about an hour north of Atlanta, which is probably as cold as it gets here. And his two last year died to the ground, but did come back. So, you know, I think it's definitely worth trying some, somewhere in the United States. But magnificent trees, but they're only found in this one little kind of cove. The trees we were seeing were probably 120 feet tall. Is it evergreen? It's deciduous, yeah. But a lot of trees there go deciduous really late. They almost look like uh, they would be, at, like this is, you know, middle of October and showing no signs that the leaves fall up. It's probably more like 
you know, they go completely evergreen and say January. You know, it's a real short short window of, of dormancy. How, how do the flowers work? <coughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know. I've never seen the flower. I don't know that those guys have ever seen the flower. You know, Dan's been 12 times, but he's never been to Vietnam in, in the in the spring. And as we try, you know, try to expand our funding base, that would be the goal. Is uh, I think if you could go in the spring, especially with the rhododendrons, you know, to be able to tag those, because a lot of times when we go, the rhododendrons really kind of look the same, but they're probably not. You know, it may be that you're looking at a group of 10 rhododendrons and seven are are different. But you know the leaves look close enough that you're probably not collect collecting the full breadth of what's actually there. You know things like Elysiums would be great to see in the spring, a Rhodolea, which is a Hamamalidaceae relative. To this, the Magnolias alone would be <coughs> great to see. And most scientists or plant explorers have not captured, you know, their what they look like in flower. And that even if you didn't collect a seed or a plant, I think. A spring trip would be worthwhile. And here's these majestic towering trees. And then I'll end with uh, oops, a more image. So that's uh, this is our ending image. So this was actually when we came out of five figures you know, through this this gap up in here. And uh, I think that's when we probably had seen the roads and we were relatively happy. <laughs> this is, uh, that's the one that got us lost. <laughs> Supposedly the, the local guy. <clears throat> uh, but in conclusion, you know, we did collect about, I think that trip about 250 different seed. A lot of them are already growing, a lot of them, them are flowering. So this is you know, two, two years ago. Um, as Bobby mentioned, I'm going to, I just accepted a position in Chicago Botanic Gardens, so I probably won't go this fall just because of my new duties, but I plan to go in the future. So I think they're going to go back to, well, Scott, Scott, this is Scott, he'll get a run in Chal Pradesh in the spring, and then we're going to go back to China again. We, uh, this last trip to Hubei, we went with Dongling Zhang, who is, uh, He's actually a Mike Durr Professor of Ornamental Horticulture at the University of Georgia. And he's from Hubei, and he's got fantastic Chinese connections. It's really <coughs> difficult, in any case, to collect in China. There's so many uh, restrictions as to where you can and cannot go. So as long as we have Dong Ling to get us into parts of China, I think we'll you know, kind of continue to do China. Because you know, with China, you never know when it's all going to just be no access. So you might as well go while you can. Uh, and then I think we'll go So probably China this year. We'll see what Scott finds in a run at Chal Pradesh. That might be uh, 2016. And then, because Dan was only in Myanmar for two weeks, we'll probably go back there sometime in the fall. And he, uh, the path that he took in Myanmar was uh, the same trek that Kingdon Ward had taken about 100 years ago, but nobody had really from a plant exploration point of view, had taken that same trek, you know, in a hundred years or so. So, while a lot of it, these areas have been collected, it's still there's so much more that ha has not been collected. And there, you know, I was talking to Rich Dufresne earlier. You know, a lot of collectors are going to these more northern elevations, and there's whole vast stretches of the world that are, you know, not collected. I mean, even Me Mexico is. Uh, uh, I've been working with a scientist there, uh, Antonio Vasquez, and he's working on mag magnolias of Mexico. And he's up to, and there's more to be found, 33 species of magnolias alone in Mexico. I went on a trip about a year, a little over a year ago to Columbia, South Carolina. We met with a local expert on neotropical magnolias, and there's 33 species of, of magnolias alone in Colombia. So. You know, I think we're, there's a lot that's happened, but there's a lot more that can, can happen. So, thank you very much. Any questions, Ryan? Yeah. Any, any questions? Yes. You plant leaves and bags in the sun. Now, when we take honey, we put it in the garden, in the 
cool it right away, how in the world can you keep them going? Uh, we're not, well, the cuttings we were taking were just of those magnolias. We weren't taking, the only cuttings we took were the Mahonia and maybe something else. So we're, you know, most of the cuttings we're taking are just so we can take them back to the room and take pictures of them. So you're not starting plants from them? No. Now it's too hard over a three week period to keep them, keep them viable. And then if they get held up, which they often do in USDA, then they, by the time you get them, they're just mush. Yes? I have a question. Uh, I have uh, uh, volume one of the uh, China Rare uh, China Red Data book with yes. the rare plant. And then I'm curious as to why uh, collectors you know, like Dan Hinckley and you and others don't collect along coastal China where so much is development is. And right. There are a lot of very endangered bird species in that area. Because yeah, I, I, I mean, maybe, maybe he has. Uh, we have, and we've done more in, inland work. You know, it's probably, I suspect, getting the elevation, maybe. I, I, no, I guess I, can't. I don't know for sure. Yes? Do any of these countries have rare and endangered um, protections like we do? Well, there, it's, it's actually an international designation called uh, 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 CITES, which is a uh, convention for the international transfer of in, endangered species. So if it's CITES listed, you have to have a CITES permit to bring it you know, back, back, well, to take it and to bring it back. So you know, most things are not. Most plants, or at least the plants we're after, are not CITES listed. They might be on what's called the, the red list, which is uh, put out by the IUCN, which is another conservation organization. The red list uh, identifies different levels of uh, threatened, so it may be like slightly yeah. threatened, threatened, very threatened, uh, endangered, uh, possible, you know, there's like, there's like eight different gradations, but if it's on the red list, it doesn't prohibit it from being um, collected. CITES is really was set up, is set up probably more for birds and animals, um, you know, initially, but it also includes, there's a lot of uh, cactus, and the one plant that CITES really does protect are cycads, which are uh, collected and sold on the black market to collectors. There's some cycads in this area? There's probably, we didn't see any, but there probably are some little uh, cycads, maybe with Zamia. I don't, I, we didn't see any, but there probably are. Yes? What are the soil like? They're very rocky. So they're, they're acidic or? Probably acidic. acidic. I, I don't know, but I think probably acidic. Yeah. Yes? In general, what percentage of your materials have you been able to get back in the we get it all back, you know, it's more what germinates. Probably, I would say 80% germinates. You know, with the magnolias, we, uh, you know, the seed you know, is probably about this big, and what we didn't realize, we couldn't see with the naked eye, is a lot of them had been parasitized with this little worm. And the USDA opened some of those packets and found the worms and then incinerated the whole box. So, you know, one, they wouldn't have grown anyways, and two, they compromised the rest of the box. So this time around, we, you know, with magnolias, we really critically looked at them more. Or if we went back again, we would probably just put all the magnolias in one box and separate them out from, from the other stuff. This, this trip to Hubei, we found probably eight different epimidiums. And Dan, on all his other trips, Wherever he went, the most he ever found was like one epimidium. So again, you just never never know. And we were in some fairly degraded areas in Hubei. The epimidiums were fantastic. Yes? What, what, the, um, what medium do you grow in these seeds? Uh, Dan grows everything like in, uh, I think it's just like a really fine vermiculite. And then he puts like a little gravel on the top and then he covers everything to keep out he has a real problem with rats and, and mice. Yeah, we don't actually, we don't take, because we're not really set up that way at the Scott Arboretum. We're, you know, where I'm going to Chicago Botanica, and they do have a history of plant collecting, so I'll, I'll find out. Okay, well, we have the zone five environment. Yes, much colder. 
who I guess will be collecting in central China. <laughs> All right, well, thanks again, Andrew. I know you're